the following show you're about to listen to is slightly different to the ones we normally do. Uh, this show was a live one recorded at the Aces and Eights Bar in Tufnell Park a couple of months ago. And rather than being our four favourite facts, it was the favourite facts of the audience. So we did no prep for this at all. It was the first time we'd heard a lot of these facts. So it's a bit ropey around the edges, uh, but stick with it because we think it's a really funny one and I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, we're putting it out this week in preparation for our Edinburgh Festival shows, which begin next week. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast this week coming to you live from the Aces and Eights Bar in Tufnell Park. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Anna Chizinski, James Harkin and Andy Murray. And once again, we've gathered around the microphone, but this time it's not with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. It's your favorite (laughs) facts. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with... Okay, you were told to put your name. This person's not put their name. <laughs> it's an absolute disaster. Why don't we... I reckon people are going to remember what their facts were. That's true. Max, Max Walker. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah. Okay, Max. So my fact is about the Scrooge effect, which okay. is if you make somebody think about death, um, they then increase how charitable they are. And also when they do donations, they then get more satisfaction from it as well. Oh, wow. That's good. Okay. Do we assume because they're thinking, I really hope someone gives money to charity when I die so that it's not as bad? <laughs> so, I, I, I think that's what people suspect, yeah. Yeah. It also makes people spend more on material goods in general. Yeah. Okay. What is this famous effect called where you um, buy something green, or you, you're, so you're doing something really good for the environment, and then because you've done that, then you do something really not very nice afterwards? It's called moral licensing. Okay. It's where you let yourself do something bad. So this sounds a bit like the opposite of that, I suppose. You're reminded yeah. of yeah. something bad that's going to happen to you, so you then do something good. Yeah. What is moral licensing? Um, what's a good example? If you don't have a shower to save water, later on, you'll leave the hob on longer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you'll fill up the kettle slightly less than normal, so it uses less energy, and then you'll go out and brutally murder three people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Moral licensing. Um, I, we, uh, weirdly, today, I read a, um, a story about a show that has been named the worst show of all time. Is it this show? uh, (laughs) In which the prizes were all charity prizes. And the idea was that it was four celebrities and it was a show hosted by a comedian back in the day called Jackie Gleason. And the idea was that if the celebrity got the question right, a bunch of care packages would go to their choice of charity. If they got it wrong, it would go in Jackie Gleason's name. So it looked like he was this amazing... (laughs) It was just like, wow, this Jackie Gleason guy is incredible. He cares so much. So here's the thing. The show was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And it got cancelled after two shows. But the second show, and as far as I know, it's the only time in history this has happened. The second show was Jackie Gleason sitting on a stripped-down set, and it was half an hour of him apologising to the audience at home. (laughs) The entire second show was him going, we totally messed up. That was horrible. We can't believe we did that to you. We can't believe we spent so much money on it. And then they cancelled the show. But it's known as the worst show of all time. Yeah, that sounds tedious. (laughs) (laughs) It is really interesting, the stuff that has a psychological effect on you that you're not realising. And they're always doing studies, sometimes quite dubious about it. But there's that study that says that if there's pop music playing in a shop, I think you're more likely to spend more money. Um, And also the fact that they start playing classical music in places that are high crime, uh, haven't they? Because then it stops people, it deters people from committing crimes, apparently. Tube stations, yeah, and dodgy parts of town play classical music at people. Okay, should we go on to the next fact? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Cool. Um, So I think it's from someone called Coralie or Coralie. Ah, yes. So if you could pass that over, I'll also read a tweet at the same time. Yeah, go for it. Um, So we have a tweet by someone called at Ollie Granger, and they said, my fact is that if you like grilled cheese, you'll have 32% more sex. Ollie's in tonight. Oh, hi, Ollie. Ollie. Uh, Was this um, an experiment you did yourself? It was on BBC News. Oh, was it? Amazing. And is that going to turn into a sexy food now when you're sort of like bringing a date home and going grilled Sh- cheese? Or, uh, champagne, oysters, rare bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to Coral. Is it Coralie or Coralie? Coralie. 
Coralie, what was your fact? In 1567, yes. um, the man with the longest beard um, di- died when he tripped over it, running away from a fire. <laughs> OK. When you trip, it's quite easy to get back up straight away, right? Like, depends where you trip. Sorry. It was a fire next to the Grand Canyon, so... <laughs> <laughs> I think this guy with the beard, I think I have heard about him. I think he used to tuck his beard in a pocket, didn't he? He had a little pocket and he used to tuck it in there so that he didn't trip over. And presumably this time the fire was on and he sort of put his hands in the air, knocked his beard out of his pocket (laughs) and then tripped up. Wow. I'm speculating. (laughs) (laughs) And I accepted that as truth. (laughs) Anytime James tells me something, I'm like, wow, okay, that's cool. That's knowledge now. Um, Abraham Lincoln... Had a beard, famously. Yeah. Not for most of his life, though, did he? The reason he grew a beard, I don't know if people know about this, is because a young girl wrote him a letter saying that if he grew a beard, then some of her brothers would vote for him. Um, Because he'd he'd made a speech or he'd made a statement in some way saying, I think it's so, like, reminiscent of kind of Shoreditch trendy people today. He said a thing saying, do you think people might think I'm a bit pretentious if I grow this beard now, this whole whiskery thing? And this girl wrote in saying, look, I've got this brother. He's saying he won't vote for you unless you have facial hair. And so he did it. And then he met her a few years later at a station, didn't he? And said, this beard's for you. Wow. (laughs) It was a different time, wasn't it? It was a more more innocent time. (laughs) The 1860s. (laughs) Um, I I just, to move on quickly, uh, there's a really good tweet here that I got from at Finneyland, which is that in 2009, two French mayors declared the same street one way, but in different directions. (laughs) (laughs) That is such yeah. a fantastic moment in history. I remember that happening, actually. Do you? Yeah, was it in... It was, like, near Paris or yeah, something. Yeah, it was in Paris, it? yeah. Yeah, and it was, like, a big argument between these two, two mayors, and they just decided, right, we're going to do it. My uncle used to be a mayor in Bolton. Did he? Okay, yeah. What, um, what, what, what did he declare well, in he defiance declared... of his counterparts? <laughs> He declared that this was actually when he was a councillor rather than the mayor, but um, they wanted to build some houses in Bolton and um, the, no one wanted them to build these houses and they tried to stop them, but they couldn't stop them because they had the law on their side. And um, my uncle thought, well, we can't stop them, but what we can do is we can rename the streets things that they don't want to put houses on. Oh. And so they came up with the idea of making a diarrhea drive <laughs> and Hitler Grove... <laughs> And they were genuinely, they actually had plans that they were going to make these streets. But then um, in the end, I think what someone backed out. But yeah. just, just on the, uh, the subject of, um, of, of things being named Hitler, um, <laughs> there used to be a guy who lived in Ohio. In, um, he was living around World War II. His name was Adolf Hitler, right? And he was living in America, in Ohio, refused to change his name. And when the guy asked him, why have you not changed your name? He said, uh, I'm not going to let one guy (laughs) ruined the good name of Adolf Hitler. And so he kept the name. And I I always, for years, I've known this as a kind of QI-ish kind of thing. And I've I've never kind of thought to think of whatever happened to his dream. Did it work? I looked into it. Ohio in America is the only place now that has Hitler-named landmarks. They've got a Hitler lake. They've got a Hitler church. They have a Hitler park. It worked. It worked. (laughs) Hitler brought the name back around. Wow. Because what was he? Was he like, give me two months. I'll bring this back. This will be a fine name again. Like Hitler did have um, nephews in Liverpool, didn't he? Yeah. And one of them, uh, hit, one of his nephews, um, wrote an article in 1939 with the headline, Why I Hate My Uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He gives really say... bad presents at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we move on? Shall yeah, we let's move fact? on to our next fact. <laughs> okay, our next fact is from Ot- Otty? No, oh, sorry, no, uh, Diane... <laughs> They are similar, to be fair. Diane Dupont? Is that a name that... Yeah, that's you? Okay. Oh, uh, can you pass the microphone over? Okay, so while you pass that on, I'll read one of these um, facts that we have from at Apatu. And they said that Canadian $1 coins are called loonies and $2 coins are called toonies. That's really cool. Good name. I'll tell you something about Canada. Um, (laughs) 
Margarine was illegal in Canada um, from around 1880 to around 1930, something like that. What was the reason? Um, it was a very powerful lobbying from the dairy manufacturers. <laughs> they wanted it to be banned because they thought that they were bring, taking away the butter business, uh, and they banned it. And then they brought it back for a little time during First World War because they needed something to yeah. put on the bread. But yeah, for a long time. And actually, in some parts of America as well, in Maine it was, I think there were seven states where margarine was illegal at the start of the 20th century. Yeah, Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin. Yeah. Wisconsin. And um, people would smuggle it over the border. They had to dye it blue. They had to dye it blue. They had wow. to dye it blue. Yeah, what, it's blue and what, pink. Why did they... <laughs> it would come in bags, little dye packets, so as not to be confused with butter. Ah. Wow. <laughs> So, once again, uh, this is just an example of the type of audience that we have when we do a comedy <laughs> game. Most other gigs, it's just people going, you suck, get off. We have corrections in a, in a told-off sort uh, of matter. Right. I wrote a tweet earlier, and I got corrected on it in four different ways <laughs> <laughs> within ten minutes. Two mathematical, one uh, simple counting thing, which I hadn't done, and one scriptural. <laughs> Pretty good. That's great. Does um, this lady, Diane Stroke, Otto Stroke, whatever your name is, uh, have you got a mic yet? I do. Cool. What was your fact? The Danish word for 58 is actually short for eight and a half three twenties. 58 wow. is what? Eight? Eight and a half three twenties. It follows like a Roman logical, numeral logic. <laughs> That's quite, it's semi similar but much more complicated to so French, isn't it? Which does, you know, um, Quatre vingt. Quatre vingt, yeah. or whatever. This uh, is much better. What? I need brackets to understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I li I'm going to put it out there. I literally don't understand what that means. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt to try and comprehend it. <laughs> Did anyone try that maths quiz that was all over the news yesterday, that logic quiz? It was good, wasn't it? It was, um, was it in Sweden? Uh, no, Singapore. S countries, confusing them. Uh, wow. We could do this whole thing in call and response, like a, <laughs> like a queen gig. <laughs> so what was it? It was a logic puzzle. It was a logic puzzle. It was where a girl and her two friends were, she was trying to make them guess when her birthday was, and she told one friend a date of her birthday and the other friend the month of her birthday, and then there's a conversation where, oh, I mean, you look it up, you I'm have not going to give it, it to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do you want to hear a really lame logic joke? <laughs> no. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> uh, it goes, it's not mine. Uh, three logicians walk into a bar and the barman says, do you all want to drink? And the first guy says, I don't know. And the second guy says, I don't know. And the third guy goes, yes. <laughs> I don't think it's that type of crowd, James. I'm not, <laughs> not going to go for that kind of stuff tonight. <laughs> yeah, the logic material didn't uh, yeah, quite work okay, tonight. I get it. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have another fact here, and it doesn't have a name. Oh, it has a name on the back from Josephine. Josephine. <laughs> All right, so while that's making it over, uh, here's another fact we got from Twitter uh, from at I Tim Pilgrim. Jelly babies were originally marketed under the name unwanted babies. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's a good fact. Okay, Josephine, have you got a microphone? Uh, yes. What would you like to tell us? Um, a rhinoceros beetle, its towing capacity is the same as um, a man lifting nine male elephants over his head, apparently. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Are they doing it to show off, or is it like a... Because I've, I've, I've not even lifted one elephant. <laughs> I could, but I've, but I've just never felt the need. Wow. That's, yeah, I mean... It's... But the idea with this, with, um, with insects, is actually it's because um, if you're a lot smaller, it's a lot easier to do stronger things. And that's because your muscle um, strength depends on the um, cross-section of your muscle. Um, which is a two-dimensional thing, and your size is a three-dimensional thing, and so it goes up quicker because you're uh, multiplying it three times rather than two times. I'm not explaining that very well. No, but... no, that's good. I've always felt inferior to ants because of this kind of thing, and that's... It, it's not because of that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> they work in a team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ouch. <laughs> um, there, is, I, there is one thing which is, and it's... I think the strongest uh, organism in nature, and it's a lot. It's even smaller than the rhinoceros beetle, but uh, it's Is gonorrhea. It? Yeah. Gonorrhea can tow something like a hundred thousand times its own weight. 
which is um, which is probably why it's so successful. <laughs> we, not from our perspective, but it, it has these uh, filaments all the, all around it called pili, which it sort of la- it crawls along things with them, and it has this huge, huge pulling capacity. It's very cool. Wouldn't Andy make the most fantastic STI doctor? <laughs> Just as you're getting the news that you got gonorrhea. Interesting Good fact, news. actually, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know which, uh, Dan, which is your strongest muscle in your body? Um, what would you say? My tongue? Is oh, that a muscle? Yeah, oh. It's a reasonable guess, but it's wrong. <laughs> and so the strongest absolutely will be your ass, your gluteus maximus, and that's uh-huh. pretty much because it's the biggest. It's got the biggest cross-section. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> But the biggest by um, by actual, like, not by size, but the biggest by, like, square centimetre is not in your body, but it is in Anna's body. It's the uterus. It's really? the strongest. What's the your that... uterus is actually very weak. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a challenge. Let's get your uterus out. Let's do this. Every live show, every live show he does this. <laughs> so and a uterus has the strength equivalent of a crossbow. Now, I don't understand what that means. I mean, medieval castles, when besieged, <laughs> did not go to the uterus cabinet. Does that, so is that saying if we, like, rigged up an arrow uh, somehow to our uterus, then we could propel it further than a crossbow? Or a not spot? really. A crossbow is much bigger, so it's, like, per square area Quite and stuff equivalent. like that. But, yeah. Okay. Um, that is a good fact. Just while we're talking about the body quickly, I've developed a new thing on... Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> Dan, I have to tell you from the diseases perspective, it's doing great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it's, it's an odd new thing. I've just, in the last six months, every time I wake up, I'm woken up by the sound of my own body from my face going... <laughs> Every time I wake up now, like I swear to God, every morning, every morning I've woken up going, (laughs) what's happening to me? (laughs) That's my question. I don't know what's happening to you, but have you considered donating to charity? (laughs) (laughs) Swearing. There was a man in America, I don't know what made me think of this, who was, I think he was executed. uh, And what happened was they thought that he'd had sex with a pig. Uh, and the reason that they thought they'd had se- he'd had sex with a pig is because the pig had given birth to a piglet that looked a bit like him. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he knows it's not true, that's the most insulting thing. <laughs> There's no win in that whatsoever. Oh, man. That really reminds me of a story that I remember Richard Maidley of Richard and Judy telling years ago. He went up to a woman in a bus stop and he went, Bill, hi. And this woman turned around and went, what are you talking about? And he said, Bill, right? He was like, we knew each other at school. And she was like, no, I'm Jane. And he said, oh, sorry, you just look so much like Bill. I assumed you'd had a sex change. And oh. it was you. <laughs> Bizarre thing to do. S- say what you like about Richard Madeley. He's confident. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, should we move yeah. on to our next fact? Okay, this fact uh, is from Chris R, who is at Naxfish. Do we have it? Do we have Chris R? Hello. In the meantime, shall I share my yeah, favorite please. fact that I got via email? Because I assume it's from someone who wasn't on Twitter. Yeah. Lauren Gilbert. In 1958, Khrushchev went to Beijing to meet with Mao. Mao proceeded to suggest a meeting while swimming, knowing full well that Khrushchev couldn't swim. <laughs> Aides instantly appeared with water wings for Khrushchev, and the meeting took place with Mao swimming up and down and Khrushchev flailing around in his armbands. <laughs> that is How amazing. Cool image That's is amazing. That? <laughs> okay, who has the microphone? Hey, Ooh, hello. Hello. Go for it. Right. Um, the police department in Cambridge, Massachusetts, requested that when the Harvard Bridge between Cambridge and Boston was refurbished in the 1980s, that the graffiti on it was maintained by the people who created it because it became useful in identifying where accidents were on the bridge. So they would say, oh. by the penis. <laughs> it was That's quite really nerdy great. graffiti, to be honest. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Oh, it was, it was yeah, an positive. MIT prank. <gasps> Got it, okay. Um, my favourite fact about graffito, or graffiti, is... <laughs> well, which face. is it, James? Which is it? This is about graffiti. Okay. Uh, and it is that there was um, a Christian group, I think it was in the south of France, I think, and they were um, clear, cleaning up graffiti. 
uh, and they were doing it because they were very nice people and they started cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and then only afterwards did they found out they'd actually cleaned off a load of prehistoric cave paintings. Oh! <laughs> My God! How did the, I mean? Surely there's a difference that you can tell between. That is true. Although a, they know. think that a lot of prehistoric cave paintings were done by teenage boys, right. actually. And a lot of French graffiti is of buffaloes being killed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can I read out? Because we yeah, got go sent on, go in. On. So we got an email when we said we need facts for tonight, and we got an email from a lady called Lauren Gilbert, who we just had this fact from Anna about Khrushchev. Uh, which is that, um, so she gave us 10, and this was my favorite one. I'm going to read it out exactly word for word what she's written. F. Scott Fitzgerald bitched to Hemingway that his dick was too small, <laughs> then went to the bathroom, and Hemingway looked at it and pronounced it fine. <laughs> <laughs> He had a terrible injury, didn't he? To his up I'm going off memory here. Hemingway had a very bad uh, shrapnel wound, possibly, in the First World War, which, sort of, which uh, dealt with severe damage to that region, like the top of his thighs and, and his uh, parts, and uh, private parts. And um, that, that, there is a theory that that's why he was so about the big game hunting and the fishing. And so, when, so when Fitzgerald showed him, it was sort of like half hanging off and bleeding a bit, and Hemingway went, looks absolutely normal to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing fine, mate. Look at that. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, let's move on. Um, Steve Ackroyd, where are you? Okay, can someone give the microphone to Steve? There we are. Steve, what is your fact? So, um, the name Gary is now, as of 2013, uh, less popular in the UK, that's by people born within that year, than both the name Thor and Loki. <laughs> wow! What? That is incredible. Wow! But Gary actually isn't like an isn't an old name, is it? The first Gary was a country singer, wasn't he? Someone's going to shout out who it was. Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper. Gary yeah, Cooper. that's it. Gary Cooper. He was the first person, pretty much, I think, called Gary, and I think he might have been named after a place called Gary in America. In Indiana. Okay. In Indiana. Yeah. You see, <laughs> that, the world expert on Garys is in the audience. <laughs> Uh, Sorry. So, <laughs> what, what other name knowledge do you have then? It's kind of limited to basically that, and I definitely learned it from a different podcast. I apologize. <laughs> uh, you brought someone else's fact from another podcast to our show? Good. Do that more. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I needed to raise the bar, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, how many people in uh, North Korea do you think are called Kim Jong un? Uh, Do you know the answer to this? In French? Is correct. Really? Yeah. There's only one person called Kim Jong-un because he made it the law. It? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he made it the law that everyone else who had that name had to change their name to something else, to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> right. To be fair, I don't reckon there are many Queen Elizabeth II's That's in true. Britain. <laughs> Yeah, wow. but she didn't I guess it would be it. Elizabeth Windsor. Would all the Elizabeth Windsors would have to change the name? Yeah. Or... Does anyone here know anyone called Elizabeth Windsor? <laughs> there we are. Uh, the seat. Nobody. See, nobody knows anyone called Elizabeth Windsor. And that is We're a scientific just... experiment that yeah. just happened right in front of your eyes. <laughs> I got sent a fact by someone for tonight, and it was a fantastic fact. It was really good. But I got so distracted by his name that I forgot to write his fact down. So <laughs> I don't have his fact now, but I do have his name, and his name <laughs> is Andrew. His surname. Go to bed. <laughs> As one word. He's called Andrew Go to Bed, and he goes by Andy, and he has a middle name which is William, but he goes by Will, so Andy Will Go to Bed is his full name. <laughs> Isn't that great? I found something about names the other day. This is just completely random now, but uh, the first English, the first teacher of the English language in Japan was called Ranald MacDonald. <laughs> <laughs> why, did, why did he move to Japan? <laughs> uh, that's such a good thing. That's great. Uh, okay, another, another one. Let's keep going. Yeah, let's pick okay. another fact sent to us by Twitter. This is from at 83 underscore bis. When the tooth of a mastodon was found in North America, it was identified as the tooth of a giant. Wow. Now, that's very exciting to me, because if you've listened to this podcast, uh, we talk. I talk a lot about yetis and so on. I've worked out... <laughs> That's the period I should have been born in. When someone's finding a big thing and going, well, it's obviously the tooth of a giant. <laughs> that's, that's right there. That's when I should have been born. I would have been the man who went, what's well, clearly a giant. And they would go, Mr. Schreiber, you are. <laughs> well, there was the other thing, the um, first dinosaur bone, which they thought was a scrotum of a giant. And they called it scrotum humanum. <laughs> Uh, and it turned out to be a megalosaur, I think. But uh, by the strict rules of nomenclature, they should still call it scrotum humanum because you're supposed to call it the first thing that you called it. Are you? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, 
Megalosaur, I still call it a scrotum human, actually. <laughs> but you, as we've ascertained, call it graffito. So <laughs> we, know, we know what you're like. That is true. Um, shark's teeth, when they were discovered, fossilised uh, shark's teeth. Sharks obviously go really many, many millions of years back, and um, often their teeth are the only bit of them which survives because they are all cartilage. They don't have any bone. So we, know, uh, we only really know about fossil, fossil sharks or ancient sharks from their teeth. But they were thought to be uh, dragon's teeth, Un unsurprisingly, oh. and they were uh, crushed into powder and sold as a medicine. Wow. Yeah. 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 And people still take bits of shark as medicine to this day, but they shouldn't. Please uh, don't do it because it doesn't work. <laughs> 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 you just got a dead shark then, <laughs> and you're not any better. <laughs> uh, okay, another, another one. Um, Esther Clark. I really like the fact that people say alcohol is not a solution, but according to chemistry, alcohol is a solution. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> All right, so you like the chemistry jokes, but you don't like yeah. the logic jokes. What's going on? There? I hope you don't work at an AA centre. <laughs> that would be. All right, alcohol is not the solution, except, of course, that it is the solution. Okay, okay. Right. Something's dissolved in something to make it alcohol. That's yeah, you could have pure alcohol, but it's really hard to get hold of. Most of our, most alcohol is in water. <laughs> so alcoholic drinks are the solution. Yeah. <laughs> pure alcohol is not. Pure alcohol is poisonous. Well, that's very responsible, so you're not advocating pure alcohol. No. I think that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think if you put water and alcohol together, like 40% is about the, the best kind of solution right. for alcohol and, and water. And the person who found that out was Mendeleev, who did the um, periodic table. And I think he did it for his dissertation or something like that, and he worked that out. So he was the first person to do it. How did Mendeleev work out that 40% was the best? He was a chemist, did... and he tried lots out. And that did was, he? Yeah. So there's, no, there's notebooks increasingly spidery and slurred <laughs> towards the... 55 to 45. That's the age. Okay. If the giant age is the age you should have been in, I should have lived in the age where you could just drink loads of alcohol and claim you're a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> and this also reminds me of another brilliant fact that was sent in by email by Lauren, I think, um, which was that the first ICBMs, the ballistic missiles, um, placed by the USSR outside of the USSR, which were placed in East Germany, could never have been used because the soldiers in charge of them drank the rocket fuel because it was made of alcohol. Oh, no. That's like with the, uh, when um, it was, uh, they sent up a bit of bark from the tree that Newton uh, was apparently sitting under when he had the apple and he realised the idea of gravity. Uh, they sent that up into space with an apple and the idea was that they were going to drop the apple and they were going to drop the bit of bark together so that could, they could experience a lack of gravity. So it was a very exciting moment. But they forgot to tell some of the astronauts why the apple was up there. And so they ate it, and then they were like, OK, time to do the experiment. And they were going, what? Experiment? So they ended up doing the experiment with a bit of bark and a pear that they had. <laughs> no one likes pears on the International Space Station. Um, uh, shall we move on to another fact? Yeah, Andy, learned. you've got one, I think. Yes, I have. Uh, this is from Adam. Hey, Adam. Okay, so I'll pass the mic off. And uh, while we're doing that, mic. I got a, um, a tweet from someone called Olivia Annie, at Olivia Annie, uh, and she sent me this fact that uh, Bucharest and Budapest are the fifth most mixed-up places in the world. And she didn't say what the first four were. Okay. So Surely Slovenia and Slovakia. Yeah, you would, would think so. Assume, you? At all. Yeah. I don't know what the others are, but so I googled it, hmm. and I found there was a site called um, Bucharest Not Budapest dot com, <laughs> <laughs> which collects all the different times when people have mixed it up. And um, Iron Maiden, Morcheba, Metallica, and Lenny Kravitz have all mistaken Bucharest for Budapest on stage. <laughs> cool. Okay, where's the yeah. microphone? Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. There we are. <laughs> Um, the wages in Chelsea and Fulham are so high that it's the only constituency in the UK where the average wage is higher than the wage of their MP. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so their MP is like Does, the working man. <laughs> I know something about, um, I think it's the constituency of Kensington, which is nearby, it's not, not a million miles away, and um, it has the highest proportion of minors, as in M-I-N-E-R-S, in any constituency... <laughs> In the country, and it's what? What? Because, no, what? no, sure it does. Yeah, what? Because it's a lot of people who own mines, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Say, occupation mining. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, let's move on. Let's try and get some more in before we finish. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, Chris, who, where is Chris? Okay, so uh, Apollo 13 uh, nearly ended in disaster before it even got to space because of a malfunction that happened. But a second malfunction occurred that saved the ship from being destroyed. So what? Did it Which... fix the first malfunction? Yeah, pretty much. What? Wow. <laughs> That's very rare. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we have an astrophysicist on the panel today. To That's when I should have been born. The age of space. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. That's yeah. amazing. So, okay, so because there is uh, Apollo 13, my favorite movie of all time. Uh, there, it genuinely was is. Was it a real thing that happened as well as the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, it's, is it, it's not your favorite event of all time, is it? <laughs> it kind of is, actually. <laughs> no, because it's, uh, to me, Apollo 13 is the greatest story ever told. You have a tin heading out into deep space, an explosion happens, they're told they have something like an hour left of oxygen and they're going to die, and everyone on the Earth and three men in a tin can have to solve it, and the only way that they can get back home is to go that way towards the moon. It's insane. That is, and they made it home, at spoiler alert, they made it home <laughs> alive, and that is incredible. And, and then obviously there's a big line in the movie where as they're going up, there is a malfunction and they say... There was a glitch. What was the line? It was something like... Uh, uh, yeah, so they said, we've just had our glitch for this mission. Or we just like had that. our glitch for this mission, not knowing that there was going to be this explosion. Obviously, why would they have known? <laughs> <laughs> but, so, but this is an interesting fact as well about, about glitches and things going wrong when you go into space. There was a book called Moon Dust, and in it, someone from NASA was saying that on a good, successful space flight, 99.99% of things work which means a, a typical ship is six million parts. That means on a good flight, they expect 6,000 things to break as they're going up. Did you just do that in your head right then? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying um, to style that out and my mouth didn't let me. <laughs> 6,000? Yeah. That's incredible. 6,000 things. Can you imagine any other job on the first time you use something, 6,000 things break? If I was running it, I would take 6,000 very tiny, very breakable glass plates and I'd, I'd smash all of them as we set off and then presumably everything else would work. <laughs> I don't think you understand probability at all. I... <laughs> um, just another fact about um, things going wrong uh, in space. Uh, my wife told me this um, today, in fact. Um, and that is that the two biggest disasters in um, rockets in uh, Russian history both happened on the 24th of October. On different years, but they happened on the same day. And so to this day, in all the rocket fields and stuff in uh, Russia, they always turn all the electricity off and close everything down on that day just so it doesn't happen again. Really? Wow. wow. Um, there are lots of uh, Russian cosmonaut and oh, astronaut yeah. superstitions. So lots of things have built up over the, the years of the Russian space program. So I think on the final drive to the, um, what is it, the liftoff point, the... To the rocket ship? To the rocket ship, thank you. <laughs> On the final drive, the, um, the astronauts will get out, they'll stop the car, they'll get out, and they'll have a wee against the right back wheel, I think it is, yeah. of the truck. Or and that's because Gagarin did that the first time. Because Yuri wow. Gagarin did it the first yeah. time. What if you get performance anxiety and you well, can't I go? I presume it's like, that. yo, we need a launch. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> but F. Scott Fitzgerald's going, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Hemingway lied to me! <laughs> okay, should we keep going? Yeah, yeah. let's... Yeah, well, let's um, this one is from Sophie S. Where are you, Sophie S? Oh, right in the corner. So hey. let's find another fact uh, while we're doing that. Okay, so here is a fact from at the underscore image smith, and that is, if you wanted to recreate the entire Lego movie with actual Lego, you would need 15 million... 80,330 Lego pieces. Hmm. Well, to How? Try. I, I mean, yeah, but why would you want to do that? Well, we've got the Lego movie and it's the best thing that's ever been done. <laughs> we, yeah, exactly. Have we got the microphone to yeah. the... Uh... Yes. So my fact is, when a dog enters a room, it knows what's happened two hours before. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Did you learn this fact from me? Because I don't think... So he knows what food was on the floor and who was on, in the room before. And Is it from... through smell or through... Yeah, it's smell, smell. Oh, it's through smell. Oh. But it can't tell anyone. That's so nuts. Oh, oh the mic was here. 
Uh, what are you saying, buddy? My Christmas! Uh, I think he's hungry. Oh, no. Magic what a curse. Moment. What a curse. The idea is that um, once we got uh, dogs, our brains shrunk, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. And that is because when we were hunting, we needed to be really good at picking up scents and really good at hearing things, etc., etc. And so then we got dogs and domesticated them and then we didn't need to smell those things anymore and so that smell bit of our brain shrunk and then we didn't need to hear things and so the hearing bit of our brain shrunk and it's been shown that humans that were around before dogs were domesticated did have bigger brains yeah wow that was bastards just a fact yeah (laughs) there is a thing about uh anteaters which is that um when anteaters eat ants they don't digest the ants that they eat the ants digest themselves (laughs) Because the ant eaters, they, they don't have um, the proper acid in their stomach, but ants obviously have lots of formic acid inside them, so they just uh, d- digest themselves. Wait, so they do that as a kind of like Harry Carry kind of thing? Or... <laughs> no, they just yeah, when they die because oh, they've okay. been eaten, they start to produce this formic oh, acid, and that okay. then mulches the whole load of ants down. So ant eaters have now again got rid of that unnecessary bit of their digestive system, oh. which they don't need anymore. That is actually a bit like, and I actually, I think someone also wrote this fact down today that um, baby pandas can't digest eucalyptus, can they? But it's koalas. koalas, koalas sorry, koalas. sorry, panda, baby panda, koala, I mean... potato, potato. <laughs> <laughs> Whose fact was that? Come up here quickly and say it. Uh, was that baby koalas can't digest eucalyptus when they're first born, so they have to get the bacteria from their mother's kind of poo to be able to digest eucalyptus? I don't reckon humans would be able to digest stuff without the bacteria in their stomachs. And you get the bacteria from your mother through their breast milk. Yeah. So, like, a baby probably wouldn't be able to d- digest, you know, Ben and Jerry's ice cream or... <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> that was, it's no way that that's the most indigestible thing I could think of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you think, what's the thing that's least like baby food in the world? <laughs> Colder milk. <laughs> you could have said steak or salmon on croute. <laughs> We, we actually put out on Twitter, we said you could win two tickets tonight if you come up with a fact, which is... Uh, was, who was that? Was that you? Can you just yell out your fact? Because it's about Ben and Jerry's, isn't it? Ben and Jerry's milk comes from massaged cows. What? So, and I read into it. Basically, Ben and Jerry's, they have a big farm, and they really look after their cows, including before they milk them. They're just like, how are you today, sir? How's, how's that? <laughs> oh, ma'am, I guess. <laughs> That's not milk! (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's why I was kicked out of the bull rat. (laughs) Um, Who's got the microphone? We had another fact uh, coming out, didn't we? Oh, no, we don't. Let's get another one. Okay, Okay, uh, Anna. (laughs) No, I think think it's another Anna. Is there any? Oh, there's another Anna at the front. Okay, let's find another fact from our Twitter list. Okay, so... I got one here. I'll go. Well, At Timothy underscore Johnson, the motto of the Salvation Army is blood and fire. <laughs> <laughs> they were very unpopular for a while. People they... really didn't like the Salvation Army. And Maybe that was, was a... the branding issue. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were... I mean, they're a, they're a Christian organisation, and uh, I think it was William Booth who set up the Salvation Army, and he was known as the General. He was an incredibly organised and strict man. And there was another uh, army which was set up in opposition to the Salvation Army called, I think, the Skeleton Army. Oh, yeah. And they made it their business to disrupt the Salvation Army in all their good works. And they were bastards. They were, yeah, they were really unpleasant people. And they threw rocks at them, and they threw, you know, burning stuff at the Salvation Army. Whenever they turned up, trying to help. Um, yeah, wow. not wow. not funny, but you know. But was their motto flowers and candy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, should we Anna, go? Anna, what was your fact? Um, actually, uh, Tom's is better. Oh. Well, how, why don't you tell us both, and we'll decide which is the better fact. <laughs> okay. Um, so, since uh, 1945, all British tanks must come equipped with tea making supplies. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's an excellent fact. <laughs> That's um, how I imagine you exist in life, Andy. You, you're in a tank and there's tea in there. Yep. That's, that's... Bad, weak, milky tea, by the way, if it's right. Andy. Okay. Um, but anyway, well, that's an office that, issue. This is um, office stuff. This is why I say you can't work in a team. <laughs> <laughs> you're constantly throwing shade on my tea. Um, the worst um, thing is the milk came from Dan. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, should we? Uh, let's hear the second fact. Yeah. Okay. No. Also, I've read that all um, that uh, is it. JCBs are so popular as uh, digging machines because they all have kettles inside them. That was the main feature. It wasn't that they dug better? It wasn't that they could carry more stuff? They just have a kettle on board. Yes. Well. So you can make a cup of tea. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what's the rival fact? Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know it was a rival fact. No, it, was <laughs> it is now. Uh, okay, so uh, Joseph Stalin had um, uh, some Russian scientists attempt to create uh, an ape-human hybrid because he thought it would be useful uh, in Russian industry and would be able to better withstand pain. And how are you getting on, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! I call a foul! <laughs> how far down the process did he get? I, I, I don't know. But the they enjoyed the special. dinner, but the bedroom was a complete disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was ultimately a failure. And he had... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he had the, uh, the scientist who was leading the project exiled to Kazakhstan for failing. Really? Wow, <laughs> that's tough. Because he probably didn't want that project in the first place. <laughs> um, there was, a, there was a prediction. You know these cool old predictions they have of how life is going to be in the 21st century from 100 years ago, and they're always either spookily right or ridiculous. And <laughs> one of them said that we won't have to drive our cars anymore. This is from, I think, the 20s, but I'm going off memory. We won't have to drive our cars anymore because we will have a race of hyper-intelligent monkey butler <laughs> creatures which will do the driving for us. That's the only thing we'll have taught them to do. Well, th this ties in nicely with a Twitter fact that we got sent by a guy called Ewan Taylor, uh, which is... Uh, sorry, this is Facebook. Book. In 1953, NASCAR driver Tim Flock raced for eight races with a rhesus monkey named Jocko Flocko <laughs> as his co-driver. <laughs> so maybe he was trying to start the revolution there, <laughs> or the evolution, I don't know, whichever. <laughs> um, we should, let's do one more and we should wrap up. Okay. We, Why don't uh, you choose, Anna? Yeah, Anna, go for it. Yeah, sorry, I, I think I forgot about the whole fact choosing thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's from Steve. Steve, yeah. Uh, it's about particle accelerators. Yes. This is the kind of crowd in which we could have two Steves yeah. who've both brought a fact about particle <laughs> accelerators. Very true. <laughs> okay, let's read something out. Uh, oh, oh, I've, oh, I've got one. one. Um, this is from uh, at TBUK2, Tabuktu. It's, it's a Twitter name. Uh, you may have already done this one. A consultant urologist at Musgrove Park Hospital in Taunton, Somerset, is named Nicholas Burns Cox. <laughs> No! <laughs> really? Hello? Did you send us that fact? No. Was that... no. Oh, my God. That's cool. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, but... I'm from Taunton. He's really nice. Wow. My mum's Don't from the Taunton it. Vale. Yeah, it's a nice place. <laughs> Can I just say we're focusing on the wrong bit of the fact here? <laughs> um, Taunton's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Park's lovely in the summer. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Bridgewater said more of that. Oh, no. Um, no? Oh, no Who is you... it? A urologist's <laughs> granddaughter or daughter owns Napoleon's penis now, doesn't she? What? Uh, I think yes, Napoleon's you're right, penis yeah. has been bought and rebought over the years and disappeared, and then it was left with a urologist who died, and he left it in his will to his daughter. Yeah, there's a lot. So there's a lot of famous um, historical male penises that have been passed down through families, <laughs> just, sold in auctions. Just male penises. Yeah, just just the male ones. Um. Any male uteruses there? <laughs> Napoleon's was described at auction as a mummified tendon, which is quite a delicate way of putting it. Right. But it was, a, it was a, an, an inch long. But it was described by Scott Fitzgerald as a very, very good size. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, last fact, final last fact. fact is yeah. from Steve. So, the only man to ever stick his head in the path of a particle accelerator not only lived to complete his PhD, but also seems to have not aged since the accident. <laughs> What? Whoa. Wait, what was the accident this week? <laughs> it was in 1978. What? So, uh, Anatoly Bukorsky uh, was a researcher at something that I can't remember the name of because I'm in a basement and my notes have vanished up there with the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I think but, how we feel. Yeah, <laughs> no, Basically, he was a researcher at, a, at an institute uh, trying to complete his PhD and um, it was time to fix the particle accelerator. And he stuck his head in it. <laughs> yeah. And the safety was apparently not working as well as it should have. And all of a sudden, the particle accelerator fired and a beam passed through his head. And he, according to his own words, he didn't feel any pain, 
but he did see a light brighter than a thousand suns. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and the, the left side of his face is pretty much no wrinkles. <laughs> is he begging to shove the other side of his head into there? Because no, presumably no, he's, that's... He's, he's actually been interested for, like, uh, Western scientists to come over and say and uh-huh. hang out with him and say, well, what's going on in my brain? But he can't afford it. Wow. I think we'll go. Cry- yeah, this is crying out for a Kickstarter. We'll go. <laughs> Spacey Dino Man and the Logician. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, let's wrap up the show and and visit him. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much, guys, for coming to this experiment tonight. Uh, We know know it was going to be chaotic, but actually, I'm just putting this out there as as someone who edits stuff. uh, That's going to edit down really awesomely. Um, (laughs) That'll be a great three minutes. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. But thank you so much for coming. I'm going to do the ending of the show. That's it. That's all of your facts. Uh, If you want to reach any of the people who said their facts during this show, you're all probably on Twitter or on Facebook. Hunt them down and question their sources. We can be got on our regular Twitter handles. Uh, I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At Egg Shapes. And Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. And we will be back again next week with another episode. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Goodbye.